So I'll be talking about big data, and we all expect to have there some information, hopefully knowledge, and some truth, hopefully. So um, my background is in computer science, and I was a little bit um, uneasy on preparing this seminar because it's already the title is out of the box. So I was like, oh, out of the box. And my, usually my talks, my seminars are fairly technical. You know, computer science, statistics, math, and so on. Um, so I would like to start it with something out of the box. And I would like to invite you to join me in a short breathing exercise, if you care. So we'll do shortly before I start talking, and it's uh, very simple. It's a, a so-called four-stroke breath. So you do four inhales in four strokes. So it's and then you exhale also through the nose in four parts. So this is one inhale, exhale, what I demonstrated. So if you care to try and feel it yourself, okay? Um, so let's start. I would encourage you to keep on and close your eyes and feel how it feels to you. Just inhale, suspend for a moment, and relax and exhale. Thank you. So that was three minutes, just for your information. So thank you so much. Uh, we all talk about information and having a lot of information around. And we know you practically can find anything you go on the web. The question is, is it true or not? Is it made up by someone? But you can find it. And also, we can say that life, in a way, is becoming very open, very transparent. We know if we go on the internet, we leave traces behind us. So whatever we do is locked, in a way. It's written somewhere in some log file of web server, 
in whatever depends what we do some database so it's good to be aware of that just to know what is happening today not that we can do much about it we can but then we kind of isolate ourselves and don't get the benefits of the what information age is offering to us so what is it about big data what is it compared to small data big data is very similar to small data just it's bigger so there is more of it uh, but having more of it having it really big also requires from us to rethink what are the techniques what are the tools what are the architectures that we are using to do some analysis of this big data and we want to solve either the same problems in a better way because we have more data or we want to solve some new problems uh, and there are three characterizations of big data which are often mentioned the first one is volume which I already mentioned it's like it's big there is a lot of it uh, and there is a challenge is challenge how to load it how to store it how to process it you can assume the big data means I can't put everything on one computer I can't process everything on one computer so I have to think about it maybe I can't even store everything there is variety of the data with big data it's not just size but we also started to collect different kind of data there is textual data on the web there are databases of course there are sensor data there are images there is videos so there are many different kind of data and maybe we want a different kind of data about the same thing about the same uh, spot about the same event so we want to combine it potentially and there is also velocity as a third characteristic which is this data is coming in real time I mentioned sensor reading so there is a sensor reading temperature or wind speed or I don't know ocean currents or something measuring and there are many of them and there are kind of you know reading every 10 seconds or something like that so there is a lot of this number and it's coming to us we have to do something big data otherwise is a popular phrase it's a, if you look on the web on Google Trends big data is kind of picking up the, the blue line is big data so if you look for a phrase data mining is popular it's out there but big data has been picking up since end of uh, 2011 end of 2012 it was almost as popular or more as data mining and there are different news talking about big data and you can see the phrases which are mentioned like big data data analytics big data analytics and so on for data mining the phrases which are most frequent are data mining techniques what is data data mining pdfs for information age it's a uh, like as popular as semantic web or a bit more the information the information age age of information and so on and for semantic web ontologies ontology a semantic web semantic search and so on so big data is definitely picking up and there are a number of new conferences opening up on the topic there are tutorials on the topic there are books we'll see a little bit later so but you can ask question why big data now so what are the key enablers that today we are talking about big data and we didn't talk about that 20 years ago one is increase of storage capacity on a computer when we store the data and increase of processing power so these two are connected to hardware in a way but then there is also availability of the data that the things are recorded in electronic form I mean all of us we take pictures you know we store things we video record and so on so there is all this data uh, so tools typically used on big data scenarios what we have to think about is uh, where the processing is hosted so where do we do it I mentioned I don't I can't do it on my computer everything so it should be hosted somewhere it's distributed what is happening also the data where is it stored it's usually distributed what are the programming models I can't use just the, the regular programming models there is this large amount of data potentially I can't even store it all I have to do something on the fly so how I index the things and what operations I perform how, how I do some more complex analytics and that's where the problem becomes, it becomes hard when I really want to do some complex operations on big data if I want to do some modeling some reasoning it's really difficult but what I can do is simple counting so with big data people start to rethink what information what problems can I solve with these simple operations which is counting what is the average of something when you know with some value maximum and so on uh, of course there is a good news also about big data which is there is a lot of data we can always ignore some of the data so there is some advantage and we get because of statistical properties we get m something more because the data is there however these statistics can also uh, kind of 
uh, tell us something which is not, not really true. So when we are looking in the data, in big data, for some patterns, the question is, what are we finding? Is it a real pattern which is valuable, which we want to know about? Or it is uh, some statistical artifact, something which is there just because there is a large amount of data and of course some combination of values is going to appear, right? Because if you have many data points, by random, by chance, there is going to be also this combination uh, of uh, unusual things. Um, so when thinking about that, what is through that, uh, I remember the, the quotation which I want to share with you, which is, uh, truth is simple, straight, and with a smile. You don't have to remember it, you have to say it, you know it, and then you have to live it. It is so simple. And I think we all want to get really truth from the data. You don't care about getting some illusions out of the data, especially if it's big data and you go through the troubles of collecting it or storing it or whatever. Um, um, so the problem of finding something by chance, we can a kind of approach in a way that we say, okay, so here is a pattern I'm looking for. Let me see in the amount of data I have, what chances are that I'm going to see the, this pattern I'm looking for just due to statistical artifact, just by random. So if I have a randomly generated data with no real pattern in it, and I search in this random data for my pattern, what is the chance that I'm going to find it, right? And then I'll start believing that that's true, but it's randomly generated. So for illustrative example, I borrowed example from a book Mining of Massive Data Set, which I recommend. It's a kind of computer science book from Stanford University, <coughs> uh, Professor Ullman. Uh, and what they were thinking was, um, example is, there is a number of people, and we want to find two unrelated people who stayed at least twice on the same day in the same hotel. So the setting is such, there is 10 on the power of nine of people and we take in observation 1,000 days and we assume that each person stays in a hotel in 1% of a time. So one out of every 100 days, the person goes to the hotel. And that's valid for every person of this t uh, 10 to the power of nine people we are observing. And there are 10,000 hotels, 10 to the five. So the question in this setting now is, and I know what I'm looking for, if everyone behaves randomly, so there is no conspiracy, there is nothing like two people are going to kind of plan and meet together in that hotel and then after some days meet in another hotel, what is the chance that my methods, that statistical methods, are going to find this uh, couple and say, oh, there is something suspicious, even though we know it's nothing there, right? So this is the calculation. I'm not going to you know, torture you to go through the calculation. But basically, if you say a person 1% of the time stays in the hotel and I have two people, so that's a 10 on the power of minus 4 probability that two people stay in the hotel and they stay in the same hotel on the same day and then that occurs twice. So I have, okay, I have this probability 10 on the minus 9 that two people go to the same hotel and then it occurs twice, so this is twice. I have joint probability. This is for two people. And now I have this large amount of data, and this is the catch. I have 10 on the ninth people. I choose two of them out of that, and then I have 1,000 days that I observe. I choose two out of that. And different ways to choose is 25 times 10 on the power of 22. If I multiply that by the probability which I calculated here, I was surprised. I was surprised when I saw this. So there is 250,000 pairs that will appear in the random data. So if you look at this 10 on the power of nine number of people, 1,000 days, 10,000 hotels, just by chance, you will identify 250,000 pairs of people thinking they are doing something suspicious. We have to check them. We, you know, I mean, this is from US, right? So they were thinking like, oh, there are terrorists. We have to send police to their door. You don't want to do that with 250,000 random pairs, right? So it depends what you assume. If you assume, I mean, what I'm saying is if you assume that there is a small number of really suspicious pairs, like if there are about 50 of them, you don't want to solve this problem in this way because you can't do it. However, I was playing with it a bit. I said, okay, so what if there is a smaller number of people, 10 to the power of seven, 
then it works. Then the expected number of pairs is, is 25 by random chance, right? So it really depends. You have to look at that. You have to look at your data size. You have to look at what you are looking at. Don't just trust statistics blindly, right? We know that. So what operations we do on big data to make it a kind of more humble for us to work with? One is a way of sampling. We do some smart sampling. Depends on which kind of questions we are going to ask later. We do the sampling, so we don't store everything. We maybe store every, I don't know, tenth or hundredth uh, measurement or whatever is coming. We want to find some similar items, so we have to be able to calculate similarity efficiently on large amount of data. We want to, if we are modeling, we want to be able to do incremental modeling. So as new data is arriving, we update the model. We don't build model again and again from the scratch. And it's simple, like if you calculate average, you can do that. You just sum things and you store the number, how many things you sum, and you can update it on the fly, right? But if the model is more complex, maybe you can't do that. And you also want to do distributed data storing, so you want to do distributed operations. So you have to think about approaches you are doing. And on the top of this, what I just said, we also want to do some more complex things like uh, what we usually do in machine learning, we do some supervised, unsupervised learning, maybe you heard about like prediction, modeling, clustering. Uh, so we have to be careful which kind of algorithm we use. Usually, we, of course, we have to trade something for something. So we use algorithms which are not giving optimal solution, but it's good enough for the problem we are solving. And we can still apply that. So I was reading this few days ago <laughs> in The Economist, and the story was just about the importance of the algorithms. I mean, it, the story is kind of, it's more fun, slaves to the algorithms, but the speculation behind was with statistical data analysis, applying algorithms, whatever it means, uh, they can find some information. There is a story about how, you know, is it good to have this or that movie star on the movie? Is it going to bring you money or not based on statistical evidence from the past and so on? So, you know, you can use algorithms and data for fun. Um, the question I already mentioned is related to this, which is as we ha we, when we have all this information out there, um, what are we finding? Is it true? Is it not true? Is it knowledge? So basically, I mean, from my point of view, you really have to think with your head. You have to decide yourself. It's the same as using any other thing. Like you have TV, there are all these wonderful shows on the TV. You have to think yourself and be clever what you are watching, right? It's your responsibility. The same with the data. You can go on the web, you can surf, you can find anything. It's your responsibility if you, I mean, you, you can find a lot of non, non real information lies, but also some truth and what to do with it and how to digest that truth. This is our responsibility. So it's wonderful that the data is there, but still humans are those which are, of course, at the end there and have to decide and do something with it. So just uh, some uh, example applications to give you a bit more concrete uh, idea what is this big data, where it can be used. So this is one application which is recommendation system. Basically what it's doing is it is online, it's running, you can check it on Bloomberg website, and it's recommending this, what you see here, additional news. So a person comes to the website, reads this news, in the time as person is coming there and reading, the system calculates what are the other news that potentially this user would be interested in reading. And it is based on contextual model, on information we have about the user, on different things, and how many different things we have, how much information about the user we have about the context, depends how good are we doing. And uh, by, in, by talking with Bloomberg, what they consider bad recommendation is if you recommend some news here and there is less than 1% of users that are going to click on this, what you are recommending. And good recommendation for them is if more than 5% of the users click on something your program is recommending. So here there is big data processing and there is statistics behind and what we call machine learning recommendation. And here are just some of the attributes that are used, just to make it more concrete. So how is the system, how is this algorithm magically recommending? What is it basically doing is it's checking some of the context of the user, including where the user comes from, what is URL of the user, was, it a was the user coming through a search engine, so there is some query associated to the URL the user is coming, 
what is the page the user is currently reading, what is the history of the user, what is the, is the, user, what is the country that user comes from based on the IP number of a computer that the user comes. If the users are registered, which is in some cases situation, then what is age of the user, gender, income, and so on. So there is different information. If you have more, of course, you hope to have better models and have better recommendation. Is there any questions so far? I have just a few more applications to show you, not much. So you can interrupt if you want. OK. Do Good. you know the percentage by which it was increased So with the articles? With the articles, it was, um, I think it was like 6% or something like that, which was very good. Because originally, they had just manual editorial recommendations. Mm -hmm. And the system we had using machine learning was doing better. That was for their measure. Basically, what Bloomberg did was they compared to their baseline, and they had like a competition. So there were several companies competing with different approaches trying to do the prediction. And then they decide. And they, they are keeping it on. Like they are kind of, OK, now we have this one which is doing well, but we will keep also testing the others. Maybe they improve and so on. The other application with New York Times, um, it's about online advertising. It is also about user modeling. But when they were thinking about how to use it, they decided that it's interesting for their marketing department. And what is happening there is there are all these readers, or so there's uh, electronic version of New York Times that are coming. They are reading articles. And there is a log file of the readers who is coming and reading what, right? So there is about 10 million page clicks per day that is happening there. That's about amount of information. So then this information, this stream of clicks, is combined with the content of articles, because you know what the user is reading. So this is content to build user profiles. And then this stream of user profiles is analyzed with the system for trend detection to find user segments, which is basically saying, try to cluster users, group users based on their interests, what they are reading about. And in this way, one of the things the system found was like segment, which then was named stock market based on keywords of the articles the users were reading, or green energy segment, and so on. So they said, oh, green energy, that's interesting. So now we can go to advertisers and tell them, look, we have a model which can predict when the user comes to the page that the user is from the segment green energy. Are you willing to pay me more now to put your ad on? Because I'm not putting it to, to random user. I'm putting it to the user which is interested in green energy. So if you're a company which do something with green energy, there is higher probability the user is going to click on that. right? So they found that uh, useful. This is just scale, which I mentioned. It doesn't matter. Uh, the third such application, which is connected to big data, is in telecommunication network. And it's about, about 25,000 devices in the network. And if one device fails, usually it, it is, there is just a flood of alarms. It's not just one device, because the second one can't work, because this one failed, and so on. So there is like a domino effect. And it happens very quickly. So the question is, like you have 10 to 100 alarms per second failing devices. Can we do some analysis of that? So there is a visualization of data, which is happening now. And there is also off the line uh, analysis modeling for the prediction. And concrete problems which were solved there by the means of statistical method, machine learning method, artificial intelligence, is root cause analysis, which is basically finding which device is responsible for all this flood of alarms that is now suddenly hitting me, right? The second one is short-term forward prediction. So in the next 15 minutes, which devices are highly probable going to fail? And the third one is long-term anomaly detection, which is a kind of, you know, in a longer term, tell me where I should be careful. Maybe some device is not really uh, behaving well or it's going to cause some troubles. And this is running in British Telecom. Um, then there is another, this, this, this uh, problem is uh, more research. It's connected to two European research projects. And the idea is uh, to monitor mainstream media across the world. So it's uh, crawling news, 25,000 publishers, chlorine articles, analyzing them, uh, tagging them with uh, what, not, what are the name entities, different semantic annotations, and so on, structure extraction. And then the challenge is to process this and query on this extracted data. 
And of course, there is also the issue of multilingual data. So there are interesting research problems, but there is also a concrete setting, which is this crawling on of the news. And this is a URL, you're welcome to check, newsfit.ijs.si, if you're online. Uh, it's a demo, so it works more or less. Sometimes it doesn't, but it should work all the time. It's just crawling news, and if you log on, if, no, if you just go there, it shows you the recently crawled news, and if, he, if the news has geotech, then it's also placed on the map. And then on this news, we do different kind of analysis on the top. Connected to text analysis, which is not so much about big data, it is little, but this one is more about complex data analysis, is um, enrichment of textual data. So here it's natural language processing, annotation with keywords, extracting entities, uh, linking entities with the ontologies. So if there is a Brazil or Italy mentioned in there, if there is Brazil, what is it? Is it a country? Is it a football club? What is it? To connect it to DBpedia, to OpenPsych, based on the context in which this word is occurring and so on. Uh, also, text visualization is important for large amount of data, and you can do text visualization on different, like on topics, on social, on temporal view, and just rushing through due to time constraint, but just to give you an idea. So you search over a news collection of news articles. This was an instance from Reuters News in 96-97, searching for Clinton, all the news that mention Clinton, and then the system clusters them. So there is a cluster about mentioning Clinton with Israel, mentioning Clinton with government, with trade, and so on. So each cross here is one news article, and the words show the most representative words for the content. And then you can also observe news, stream of news over time based on the topic. So here you can see years, like from 1938 to 1944. This is New York Times archive, searching for Belgrade. And you can see there was actually a lot of about Belgrade before uh, 1941, right? It, it, it was a lot, and this is clustered by topic. So this is just five clusters. The orange one is mentioned in Belgrade in the context with Italy and Germans. The red one is mentioning uh, Croatia and Prime Premier. This one is mentioning Balkan and Europe. This one is Soviet, and this one is uh, Bulgaria and Balkans. And then suddenly here, there are so much other things happening that Belgrade and mentioned in Belgrade wasn't so much important anymore. So there, there were, if you look at the data now, you would say, okay, so some, some historians should be able to see from the news, regular news in New York Times, that something is going to happen there, right? There was so much activity and it dropped. Uh, and also before it was low, right? So you can see that there is some outburst here if you get to look at the data. Uh, another thing which you can also check, which is search point ijs.si. Inspiration here is, if I issue a query to a search engine, this is example, I write Jaguar, I get many things, right, many answers. So if, if I'm lucky, the computer guessed what did you mean when you wrote Jaguar. I mean, what is Jaguar, right? What do I, what I have in mind? What is my context for that? So this system is on the top of this return, basically enabling you to be more precise. What it does is it clusters whatever the search engine returns. So here, the search engine assumes I'm interested in Jaguar cars because that's most frequent for this search engine. I'm not, by the way. I can move this red dot and say that, no, 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 I'm not interested in, oh, no, what I, I don't say I'm not interested, I say I am interested in cats, like Jaguar as Panther, then it's just simple re-ranking of whatever search engine returns to adjust to my view, to my context. So now I get on the top something which was previously on the position 34. I wouldn't go to 34th position. I mean, I usually look at the first page, maybe second, right? So this is uh, kind of useful and it was found to be useful. Uh, another analysis which was done by colleagues from Stanford was on analysis of social network of Messenger. And there was a large amount of users engaging conversation and analysis of large graph, how the communication changes, how between the countries what happens, what is the, the degree of separation, and what was found, by the way, was that this um, number six approximately holds. So most of, for, in most of the situations, there are in six steps, in six hops, you can find any other person in this conversation, in this graph. 
and uh, more precisely, it was like for 90% of the people, m up to eight hops were needed to come to any other person in a graph. Right? So this is connected to social network analysis. It's just one, f two years ago picture from our department where we work, among others, also on big textual data, on visualization, ontology extraction, question answering, social network analysis, cross-link well, knowledge extraction. Here is some literature if you are interested in big data analysis, if you want to read more. And there are more coming, and there are more books, and there are also articles which are interesting to see. Um, and this is my last slide. I can just invite you to check our department page, uh, maybe to check tools with demos if you are interested, uh, check some people, projects we have. <coughs> and also we, we basically we put this news, I also put this seminar once it's, the recording is on, online here under news. So there are also some interesting things maybe you want to check if you come regularly. Um, I think that's it. So I would welcome any questions or comments at this point. Uh, thank you, Professor.